This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. We are the paradoxical eight. Bipedal, naked, large-brained, long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves, aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. Um, I'm often told that my talks are very depressing, so I'm pleased to follow Liz Hadley, whose talk was even more depressing than mine. If we didn't already have enough to worry about, now we have to worry about armadillos carrying leprosy. <laughs> so I was given an assignment for this meeting, and it was a very upbeat question, will we survive the future? So I'm happy to say that I actually have a positive answer to that question. The answer is yes. I do believe we will survive. Uh, as Liz just showed us, we're a much greater threat to other species than other species are to us. And short of a meteorite impact hitting us, I think that the odds that humans as a species will survive are probably very great, at least for the foreseeable future. It seems to me the more relevant question, though, is how will we survive, and particularly in what condition? Anthropogenic climate disruption and its companion threat of ocean acidification threatens to reverse the developmental gains of the past 50 years, decreasing the quality of life in wealthy nations and pushing still more of the world's poor, as well as other species, to the edge of survival. The president of the World Bank, Jim Yong Kim, has recently noted that climate change is a fundamental threat to development, one that threatens to reverse 50 years of progress. So what will a future of unmitigated climate change look like, not just physically, but socially, economically, and politically? This was the question that Eric Conway and I set out to answer in our book that also has a very optimistic title, The Collapse of Western Civilization. <laughs> the book takes place in the year 2393, when a historian looks back on our present and asks the question, how was it that they knew so much about what was happening to them, had so much good scientific information, and yet did so little to prevent it? The year is 2393. The occasion is the commemoration of the great collapse of 2093. I wanted to read to you from the book, but time doesn't permit that. So I'll just summarize the, art, the argument and hope that you'll go and buy the book, which only costs $6.95 in its Kindle edition. <laughs> so first, our historian recounts what happened in the great collapse. It begins with the collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet. And this physical collapse then ramifies into social dislocation and the collapse of economic and political systems. <clears throat> then she tries to answer the why question. Why did people let this happen? And she argues that the grip of free market ideologies, combined with scientists' failure to communicate what was truly at stake, created a disabling paralysis. 
So my question today is, how do we avoid that future? The question of what kind of future we will have is really the question of whether we are capable of addressing the problems that are before our eyes. And this, of course, is not a new question. Indeed, I would argue it's the Malthusian question. In 1798, as most of you know, Thomas Malthus asked the question, can the Enlightenment project work? By that he meant, can we reasonably expect to improve the condition of mankind? And his short answer was no. And for this reason, Malthus is often considered an anti-Enlightenment philosopher. He rejected as impossible and even misguided the Enlightenment aspiration to achieve the perfectibility of man and of society. He even doubted the possibility of long-term and sustained improvement. Now, most of us also know why Malthus came to this pessimistic conclusion. It was what he called the positive checks, positive in the sense of absolutely positively certain. And those were the checks of famine and disease and the misery and mortality that ensued from them. Now, most of us also know that happily, Malthus was wrong. And it's generally taken to be received wisdom that the main reason he was wrong was because he failed to appreciate the empowering effects of technological innovation. The 19th and 20th century saw technology enabling a number of key developments that helped to stave off the Malthusian disaster that he imagined. The most important, of course, was increased food production. But also, arguably equally important, better public health through sanitation and vaccination which led in turn to the greater survival of children. And the survival of children, along with the education of women and the development of technologies, available technologies of population control, allowed many of the nations of the world to bring their fertility rates down without the misery or vice that Malthus feared. Because of this success, because of how much technology played a role in the development of the Western world, in the last 250 to 300 years, technological success has become a foundational tenant in many of our beliefs, particularly those of us living in wealthy, industrialized, technologically endowed nations where we have benefited the most from these technological successes. Indeed, our belief in technology is so foundational that we can name several philosophies that express this belief. So, for example, technophilia, the love of technology, cornucopianism, the belief in the continued productivity of technological innovation, technofideism, or faith in technology, and more recently, something I've been calling disruptivism, a belief in the power of disruptive technologies. In fact, these philosophies are so powerful that some of them even have their own Bibles. So some of you are familiar with the Bible of cornucopianism, the book The Resourceful Earth. Now, one of the things I find most interesting in, about faith and technology is that it cuts across party and ideological lines. In fact, I would argue it's one of the few things in Western culture that does. So the cornucopians are mostly conservatives and neoliberals. They have confidence in human ingenuity and the capacity of the marketplace to do its magic. The techno-fideists tend to be traditional Republicans, Democrats, and what I call paleoliberals, <laughs> as opposed to neoliberals. I guess we have to have meso-liberals too, but I haven't figured out who they are yet. <laughs> Technofideists tend to believe in government investment in technological R&D. And then there's the disruptivists, who I haven't quite figured out what they believe in, but they talk about the need for disruptive technologies, but without specifying how those technologies come to exist. But all agree on the crucial role of technology. What they disagree about is how we get it. So liberals tend to focus on education and research, particularly in great research universities and institutions like this one and UCSD across the street. Conservatives stress free market economics and entrepreneurship, and this disruptivists don't say. <laughs> but here's the rub, and actually there's several rubs. Because I'm a historian, there's never only one answer. The first rub is what I'm calling the cargo cult mentality. And we have anthropologists in the audience, so I hope they'll appreciate what I mean by this. When you listen to the advocates of technological solutions to climate change, no matter of the left, the right, or in between, one is struck by the similarity to anthropological descriptions of the cargo cult. <laughs> by that I mean we are waiting for the goods to arrive, but we have no coherent plan how to get them. 
The cornucopians, to the cornucopians, I would ask, well, what if the market doesn't do its magic? To the techno fideus, I would ask, well, what if basic research doesn't translate into usable technologies? And to the disruptivists, what if the climate disruption arrives before the technological one? The second rub, much of this discussion ignores what we have learned or should have learned from experience. It ignores what we know from the history of technology about how transformative technologies became normal parts of our lives. Now, I live with historians, and historians don't like big generalizations. There are no laws of history, and we tend to focus on the specifics of individual developments and cases and cultures because we know they're all different. But there is a generalization that I think is broadly true about technology in the 20th century. And that is that none of the transformative technologies of the 20th century were produced either by market-based mechanisms alone or entirely by government R&D either. Rather, nearly all the transformative technologies of the 20th century involve government-private sector partnerships. And here's just a short list. I couldn't fit them all on a slide, but just some examples, rural, rural electrification, the development of telephone and telegraph, uh, aviation and air traffic control, nuclear power, the internet, digital computing, space technologies, pollution control technologies, all formed by government-private sector partnerships. In fact, the only two exceptions I could come up with, and being at the Salk Institute, I have to mention the polio vaccine <laughs> and the contraceptive pill, also developed uh, largely here in Southern California. These were private-private partnerships, but where one half of the partnership was philanthropic rather than uh, private sector entrepreneurial. Electricity is a very well-studied case in point. We know a lot about the history of the development of electricity. We know that entrepreneurship brought electricity to most Americans in major cities, but it took governmental initiative to bring it to rural citizens, and that's true in other countries as well. In fact, most other countries had rural electricity before the United States did because their governments uh, were less reluctant to get involved and because they viewed electricity as a common good rather than as a commodity. The third problem is what I'm calling the problem of persistence forecasting. And by that, I mean assuming that the future will be like the past. Technology has led the way in many radical changes in the way we live, but will it be up to the challenge of anthropogenic climate change? The Zen masters have said that technology makes major contributions to the minor needs of man. <laughs> now, I think that might be a bit strong. Having a warm, safely lit house and clean water and good food would seem to be more than minor needs. But still, in a world of laptops and iPhones, one may well wonder, are we getting the technologies we want or the technologies we need? It's now a truism that Malthus was wrong, but the fact is that billions of people on Earth today do still lack adequate food and water, and they do suffer misery for that lack. And in many parts of the world, childhood mortality remains very high. Life has improved dramatically for those of us in the upper four billion, as I think Ramanathan calls it, but it remains highly unimproved for at least two billion of our fellow citizens. And in public health, it's well documented that medical breakthroughs of the past decades have mainly addressed the diseases and even the discomforts of the wealthy to the neglect of many of the most devastating diseases of the poor. So why have we made so much progress on telephones and contact lens technology and cosmetic surgery and such relatively modest progress on solar cell efficiency and energy storage? Well, I think one part of the answer is clear. Markets respond to market signals. And without a price on carbon, there's insufficient demand for energy efficiency and storage. Governments will respond to political signals, and those have so far been largely lacking as well. And of course, this also explains why we haven't solved the diseases of the poor. And the fourth issue is the issue of inequality and inequity. Today, technological development has not resolved problems of inequality, and in some cases has, in fact, exacerbated them. So perhaps Malthus was right after all, and technology just bought us extra time. So will we survive the future? Again, I still think the answer is yes. But how we survive hangs in the balance. And it will depend in no small part on how quickly we can develop the technologies to transform our energy systems. 
And to do that, we can't just sit around chattering about disruptive technologies or letting the market do its magic, while meanwhile the fossil fuel industry continues to explore for and develop still more reserves of fossil fuels, including the Arctic, one of the few places on Liz's maps that is not filled with people, and of course we continue to use those fuels. We have to get past wishful thinking and techno-fideism to apply what we know from experience it is likely to take to solve these problems. And that brings me to the thorny issue of politics. <laughs> People don't like to talk about politics. It's awkward and divisive. In fact, we've had a whole set of wonderful speakers here today, but no one has spoken about the evolution of political systems or the evolution of governance. But without talking about political systems and governments, I don't see how we can solve the problems that we face. Now, many people have seen an analogy between our problem, our problem of relinquishing dependency on fossil fuels and the 19th century problem of relinquishing dependency on slave labor. Interestingly, some of the people who invoke the need for disruptive technology to solve climate change are the same people who invoke this analogy with the disruption of ending slavery. But slavery was not ended because of disruptive technologies that eliminated the need for slaves. It was ended by a disruptive politics that included acts of terrorism, of illegal sheltering of escaped slaves, and finally culminated in a tragic, bloody military conflict. Now, few of us are prepared to break the law to stop disruptive climate change, and I'm not advocating that we necessarily should. And I've certainly heard many of our colleagues criticize climate scientist James Hansen for, quote, crossing a line and, quote, becoming an advocate because he has been arrested protesting the Keystone XL pipeline. I do not know whether what Hansen is doing is right or wrong or whether it will make a difference or not. And of course, no one does. But as a historian, I will say this. Most of us in the climate science arena have been focused on science and technology, and to a lesser extent on the business side of business as usual. But what may matter most, what may be most urgent, and what may actually determine the question of how we survive, is whether we can create and sustain a disruptive politics. Politics makes nearly all scientists very uncomfortable. We don't want what we do to be politicized, and we are afraid of being seen as political. But it seems to me very unlikely that we can solve climate change with politics as usual. And it seems to me also very unlikely that we can solve climate change without, with our scientific thinking as usual either. And so maybe the time has come to think about that. Thank you very much.